Hello, and welcome back to the Thinking Progressive Podcast. I'm your host, Ron Rivers, and in this episode, we're going to discuss why progressives should reject identity politics. Now, let me begin by recognizing that this episode in in my writing comes from a perspective of privilege. Um, The intent of this episode is to explore alternative options of empowering our most disenfranchised, opportunities that I believe will allow us to be better organized and more effective in our shared struggle. Identity politics have become central to the politics of both liberal and conservatives here in the United States, and and the nation is is worse off for it. That's because identity politics are, are just tribalism under a different name, ultimately serving to divide us. In bringing expanded structure to our movement, progressives should reject identity politics in favor of a more unifying effort to build a majority focused on systemic reform. Uh, Given the sensitive nature of this topic, I want to spell out clearly what this argument is not about. Rejecting identity politics is not a denial of the struggle of black and brown people throughout the United States. It does not deny the clear evidence of racially biased policing in the United States and the disproportionate incarceration rates it produces. Rejecting identity politics is not an escape from the reality of America's racist past and present. Throughout American history, we see several different approaches to identity politics that fell short of achieving their intended outcomes. We're going to focus on three documented attempts to elevate disenfranchised black communities and explore their successes and their shortcomings. Each effort is essentially a lesson that we can move forward from as we imagine new options. Now, grouping with people who share our interests and our way of life is a defining part of the human experience. Connecting with others around shared interests ignores class. We're bonding over mutual positivity. We're social creatures because of evolutionary conditioning. It's how we survive. Recognizing ourselves for who we are is is really primary to thinking beyond identity politics. In his book, Up From Slavery, Booker T. Washington expressed his disbelief that fighting for social equity would bring results. He believed that society would embrace any person or race contributing to economic prosperity. His approach to identity politics was expressed through his founding of Tuskegee University. Uh, There he educated newly free slaves on mastering trades and seeking employments. His efforts at the time were widely recognized and his life was one of of noble service. But Booker T. Washington's vision relied on the generosity of those in control of our economic institutions. Instead, newly freed slaves, but with new forms of institutionalized racism through the black codes, and the deck has essentially been stacked ever since. Attempting to play the game is not a viable option for progressives focused on systemic reform. The best possible outcome is that a small group of people become very wealthy. It offers no way for the majority to break away. It also ignores the arrangements of society central to structural disadvantage. Separatism was another form of identity politics that was slightly favored in the past. The idea was that black communities would form a nation to reclaim their culture and experience stolen from them. Um, Louis Farrakhan promoted this ideal through the Nation of Islam, but was unable to generate enough support to, to make it real. The problem with separatism is that it's a retreat, it's a self-imposed exile, and it ignores existing alliances. The result would be a stagnation of the culture and people in the long term. Isolationism is is not a strong strategy uh, for a transformation. Separatism really offers no hope for overcoming the injustice in society, and it offers no viable options for addressing systemic equality today. After the abolishment of slavery, the United States experienced a Reconstruction Era where we essentially established what was called the Freedmen's Bureau, and it was to provide food, shelter, to build schools, and give medical and legal assistance to former slaves in the South after the Civil War. The Reconstructionist approach to identity politics is that race and class are not separate issues. But unfortunately, the Bureau didn't accomplish much due to underfunding and political opposition from wealthy elites. The philosophy that supported these efforts was that race and class are not separate and that our struggle against racial injustice needs to correspond with economic reconstruction. It was the last genuine attempt to create a political alternative where we would tie race and class together. Today, the United States philosophy is that race and class are separate and we we essentially deal with race first and then class second. Um, Affirmative action illustrates this well. It's it's an example of a good intention failing to meet its fullest potential. 
Affirmative Action's goal in the United States has been to empower agency within poor black communities. It focuses on expanding access to the educational, employment, housing, and opportunity resources that they have been denied for so long. The policy has contributed to progress in society, but has not succeeded in empowering our most disenfranchised. The majority of the benefits went to students whose parents were really already in a professional working class, people who could afford to go to college. The biggest benefactor being white women. Um, affirmative action left behind a majority of poor black people that it was intended to serve, pushing them further into cycles of radical insecurity. Now, hindsight shows us that these redistributive efforts focusing on identity help some, but do not address the primary generators of inequity in our social structures. This argument isn't a call to end or diminish affirmative action in, in any way. It's a challenge to progressives everywhere to recognize that the same communities benefited by this identity policies would be better served by efforts to address structure. Affirmative action had another unintended consequence in breaking apart a working class majority by offending the white working class. By dividing poor working class people into separate regimes of opportunity, we've split what essentially could be the progressive majority in the United States. Now, I recognize that America's white working class has done much to damage its reputation in the recent years, souring many perspectives. But I want to say that they're not unjustified in feeling like victims of scheming elites. It's necessary to recognize that both communities of color and whites are hurt by economic policies favoring the wealthy. Combined with rapid shifts in energy efficiencies, it's abandoned entire communities, which they've then only been preyed upon by unscrupulous drug manufacturers who essentially pumped opioids into their communities. Now, this isn't an attempt to justify bad behavior. That's, that's not what I'm doing here. But it is recognizing that this exists and it requires us to understand that identity politics only amplifies this tension. Progressives won't be successful in building a national base without new approaches that aren't weighed down by the frustrations of the past. Over the last 70 years, liberals have relied on identity politics as a substitute for developing projects to address the root of injustice in our poor working class majority. This strategy has actually strengthened conservatives because it's resulted in decades of policies that generate capital gains for the wealthy and intangible moral victories for those without. Uh, a moral victory would be something, for example, like uh, abortion. That's a big you know, thing that is very popular now. Abortion for many people is a moral crusade. So while you've created a base of single issue voters that care about abortion, they'll struggle and fight for that while ignoring that they're the ones most disenfranchised by economic policies uh, put forth by the very people they are voting for. As Americans, we don't give class enough weight uh, compared, for example, to like the Europeans. Instead, we rely on race, religion, and communities to shape our beliefs about ourselves. Now, we can summarize our exploration of ourselves in, in really two questions, right? Who are we and who can we become? All of our identities are given shape by a history that has long preceded us. We exist within unending moments of now, all of them influenced by the past. Progressives should recognize that central to our movement is the understanding that humanity's strength is our ability to transcend, to become more than we are. Our thoughts, our language, and actions, they continuously evolve and grow over time, continuing creation in seemingly infinite directions. There is more of us in each of us than in any of our social, cultural, or political systems surrounding us. Every single one of us is just an extension of the same universe. Identity politics create divisions that ignore class in their solutions, but operate within a competitive class-based structure. Identity politics forces us to fight for the interests of the identities that we embody, all shaped by a past that we had no voice in crafting. And what do I mean by that? I mean, I didn't, I didn't ask to be born a white male in the Northeast United States. Now, I extracted a lot of privilege for that, right? Growing up in a state with great public education, growing up uh, with parents who were genuine about my success and cared about my success. Of course, I had struggle and trauma just like everyone else. However, we're all born into these identities and we cannot meaningfully transform the future without letting go of the social constructs that come along with these inherited identities. 
whatever shape your identity occupies now is, is only a beginning. Today is the start of who you are, not the destination. Progressives should seek to build a society that learns from our collective experiences, but is not restricted by them. The political disadvantages of identity politics are apparent. Uh, an example that highlights the weaknesses created by identity politics is caucus groups. Um, legislative caucuses are subgroups within a party. So if you ever went to your state democratic party, um, you'd see there's a bunch of breakouts and they're comprised of people typically sharing some common descriptive traits. Um, they meet to organize member actions, policies, and endorse candidates aligned with their values. Uh, caucuses are, are a form of voluntary separation. Each separate caucus acts as a small fiefdom, a small kingdom competing with others within the party for access to limited resources to advance the objectives of the group. Struggles for position and power of the identity overshadow the more significant movement of institutional innovation and ignores our primary commonalities, the things that unite us. The same structures that generate inequities imposed on the Latino caucus are oppressing members of the Black caucus. Progressives can't lose sight of that. As the progressive movement begins to develop a deeper organizational infrastructure within the United States, it should avoid the traditional identity-based caucus approaches to organizing members. Instead, promote conferences with issue-focused breakout sessions. We can imagine statewide progressive meetings to address local issues and lay the foundation for national projects. Extreme inequities exist, there's, there's no denying that. Stemming from our laws of property and contract and perpetuated by those who hold power today. Redistributing wealth from one disenfranchised group to another isn't going to address the underlying issues that generate the inequality that we're trying to remedy. An alternative to this identity-first approach is the development of new social, legal, and economic arrangements. Progressives need a program large enough to inspire imaginations towards a new way of living, but also developed enough to allow for piecemeal implementation. So we can't say that we're ready to you know, be Star Trek tomorrow, as much as I'd love that, right? Um, but we also, you know, we can't be shy enough to only make these incremental improvements with no larger vision of what we're working towards. The larger vision is the story that ties people into the incremental change. We can see examples of this philosophy in its infancy through presidential hopeful Bernie Sanders policies on democratizing the market economy, socializing banking, and, and decoupling educational funding from municipality taxes. These programs illustrate policy proposals that recognize the underlying causes of social inequity. They are the first step towards a larger structural project, and these issues contain the substance to unite a progressive majority of working class people throughout the United States. The rejection of identity politics doesn't ignore the fight against racism here in the United States. It actually makes it more effective. Uh, we recognize racism for what it is. It's intentional aggression against a person or persons, and we criminalize it. Democracies across the world already have these measures in place. Individualized racism connects to structural issues, but they are two different evils. Australia's Racial Discrimination Act makes it unlawful to behave in a way that is reasonably likely to offend, insult, humiliate, or intimidate a person or group because of their race. It includes racially offensive material posted on the internet, in newspapers, comments in public spaces, and racially offensive speeches at public rallies. It also includes provisions supporting free thought and speech. You can use racially charged language in artwork, in performance, in public statements for academic or scientific debates and discussion, accurately reporting matters of public interest. So you would say, oh, you know, so-and-so said X. Uh, and for fair comments, expressing a genuine belief. So we're not banning the words. We're not banning that they exist. What we're saying is that as a society, we will no longer allow them to be used to assault others, to, to oppress others. We, just like we wouldn't allow violence to be used to oppress others. It's just a different form of violence. By making clear distinctions between intent to harm and the exploration of thought, the bill provides a pathway to higher consciousness. Germany evolved a quote-unquote defensive democracy after World War II. They recognized that democracies might require limits on free speech and imagery to prevent the rise of despotic and racist rule. Democracies need shared values of democratic coexistence and peace. Beliefs that support violence and the suppression of particular groups of people to gain power, they, they have no place in modern society. One possible path is to legally recognize and classify the psychological damage and trauma caused to targets of racism. 
making deliberate racial hate and aggression akin to assault. Appropriate charges bring enforceable restraints into society. There's already legal precedent for criminalizing speech intended to harm others, such as, for example, yelling fire in a movie theater. When implemented, we can expect conflict and protest from those within society today who believe that racism is an acceptable form of expression. Thinking long-term, education about and criminalization of racism will lay the foundation for higher degrees of responsibility in social conduct. No democracy is safe from itself. We have to continue to evolve. That is a choice that we all have to make individually. Progressives can expand upon this idea by developing projects to give states the abilities to address structural and individual racism. Today, the United States contains several classes of people stuck in a cycle of disadvantage and exclusion that they cannot escape from. In these circumstances, where there's no hope of ever becoming you know, better, of raising your class status, the state and community must free them from their institutional imprisonment. Now, consider the prison industrial complex of the United States. Poor black people are the majority of victims, and the majority are imprisoned for small-scale drug offenses, like having an eighth of weed or something like that. Now, there is also a measurable bias in our policing and sentencing of poor black males. Now, why is that? Racism is certainly a part of it, but not the whole issue. Policies like the funding of public education through municipality taxes create generational systemic disadvantage. Poor people in the United States face a multitude of issues, the combination of which is overwhelming. The politics of criminal justice reform cannot be limited to descriptive identities. It only serves to weaken the cause. Progressives should unite around a program that presents the issue of bias incarceration for what it is, the combination of the failure of our legal, educational, and political arrangements. Rejecting identity politics doesn't deny that appropriate reparations are needed to correct existing injustices. They are. But these failures are not isolated to a specific group forever. If we address these issues with identity politics at the forefront today, we'll only end up with a different bias skewed towards a different people in the future. We have to attack the problem at its root. At the heart of these policies is the theme that every human being is a source of nearly infinite potential. By relegating entire classes to the fringes of society, we are squandering a significant amount of innovative potential. Our most valuable resource given the changing nature of work. It's vital to our success to see beyond our inherited identities. Progressives would benefit from rejecting identity politics in favor of broader progressive agendas to restructure the economic, political, and legal arrangements of our society. Building the communities of tomorrow cannot be accomplished with the tactics of yesterday. Using identity politics as a strategy will act against genuine transformation. It, it divides our potential for progressive majority and weakens our movement as a whole. Now is the time for the new. Change is changing. And we are not bound to fight our battles within the divided fronts that we were born into. Unifying a progressive majority towards the development of a structurally inclusive government allows us to address the primary generators of inequality. By rejecting identity politics, we free ourselves from the puppet strings of the past. Moving forward, we unite against artificial division and systemic injustice. Hey everyone, thank you again for tuning into this Thinking Progressive podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, please take a moment to hit the subscribe button and follow our channel, whether that's through the podcast or our YouTube channel. Uh, we really appreciate it. If you really liked it, please take a moment and share. As always, your feedback is, is invited. Uh, I put this argument out here to challenge all of us. If you disagree with my argument, please say so. F give comments and feedbacks. I'll do my best to respond. As always, I really appreciate you tuning into this week's discussion, and I'll see you next week. Thank you.